Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We're glad to have you in the house of the Lord. Good to see you visitors. Appreciate your presence today. As you know, this is a holiday weekend. A number of our people are out on vacation. But we're glad to see you here. May the good Lord bless you. And to you that's listening in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. And if you get your Bibles ready and follow us in the Word of God as we bring the message, we appreciate that very much. Now at this time we'll turn the uh, service over to Paul. He'll direct the song service. And what he has lined up for us, I'm sure, will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul at this time. Try a song this time, Battle Him of the Pope. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out of each where the faith and dreams are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching. Righteous sinners by the dim and flaring lamps, his day is marching.
Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigured you and me as he died to make men holy let us die to make men free while God is marching Remember the service tonight at 6 o'clock. That will give you plenty of time to get back home even before sundown. And then the Wednesday night service at 7.30. We're making a study now of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. The working of the Spirit of God. And we started that study a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night. We'll probably be making a study of the Holy Spirit for the next year on Wednesday nights. Come and bring your Bible. If you have your Bible today, you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and Hebrews, or rather Philippians chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 1. Last Sunday, I brought a message on the Holy Trinity. Today, I'm going to bring another a message on the security of the believer. I have a reason for doing this. We thank the Lord for the song they just sang. You know, I... Thank God for this great nation. I went yonder in World War II and my life was jeopardized. I tried to defend this great country as well as many, many others. I didn't go there to fight for the Ramsey Clarks and Jane Fonders and that crowd in America. I went to fight for the real, true, red-blooded Americans over there. And I thank God for this great country. And I'm going to tell you now, dear people, Unless there's a turning around in this nation, and that pretty soon, we're not going to have a great nation like we've had in days gone by. Amen. There's too many things happening. We're destroying now, on the average in America, and it's a leading nation in the world, on destroying unborn babies. And now we're averaging two million a year. How long will God put up with that? Destroying two million unborn babies a year in this country kill them like rats and snakes beloved is pathetic and then another thing we're doing wrong is they're trying to uh, recognize homosexuality and lesbianism in this country sex perverts and things of that type giving them an open day to march and demonstrate and and of course trying to find greater recognition in the land that's exactly why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You could stretch a tent now over Los Angeles and some of the other countries, the cities on the west coast and maybe other great cities and you have uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now how long is God going to put up with this kind of stuff? And not only that, our judicial system is corrupt. It's gone if something's not corrected there about our criminal judicial system. Then we're not going to be able to handle the criminals in this nation. And many, many innocent law-abiding people, even Christian people, will die at the hand of criminals because of some crooked, sorry, no good judges. And many crooked lawyers and others and appeal courts, uh, federal appeal courts and other movements in the land today in this ACLU. As a rotten organization, I got far more respect for the Ku Klux Klan than I have for the ACLU. You're welcome. Whether you like it or not, makes no difference to me. That's a dirty, stinking, 
rotten organization in this land that's destroying the great principles of this country. Now these things are getting out of hand and it's moving as fast toward the wrath and judgment of God Almighty. We've had a great country. We love America, the greatest country in the world. Been doing more for missions and more for feeding poor people and helping others and helping other nations than any other country in the world and doing that right now. The devil would like to destroy this nation. But if something is not done about the things I've mentioned, we, don't, we won't have it very much longer. Now you remember what this preacher is telling you. God is not going to put up with it much longer. You better believe me. When the Israelites got under, out of control and when I have to force gods, what did God do? God turned ungodly heathen nations upon them and chastised them and captured them and, and caused them to, to have to repent and, and destroy many of them. Now, I'd hate to see an ungodly nation like Russia bring us to our knees to get us to repent and turn back to God. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but you never know what may happen. God allowed it to happen to Israel time and time again. Read the book of Judges, you see for yourself. And we're living in the end time. And we need to warn God's people. We need to tell God's people about the happenings in the end days. I was talking to Brother Fields the other day. He was talking about Matthew 24 being such a blessing to him. I said, that's meat in due season. We need to give meat in due season. The Lord is coming. We're living in the end time. And sin's on the increase. The devil's having a revival. And these things, something must be done about it. Are we not going to forever enjoy the beautiful America as we know it and as we've known it in days gone by? The liberals, the infidels, the crooks, and the rascals are trying to destroy this country. And the true Americans need to stand up and be counted and be heard and let people know where we stand and what, what we believe in because they're the ones that are supporting and keeping this nation together anyway. Work not for the good true people in America and the Christian people and the salt in this country. It'd be destroyed immediately. It's the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the Christian people that's keeping this nation together. And so we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that we can't go on like we are going. Now that's not my sermon, that's only the introduction. I want to read from Philippians chapter 1, I want you to turn there in your Bible, and let me read a verse, verse 6, page 1257, page 1257, the book of Philippians chapter 1, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, We'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Didn't say hope so, think so, maybe so, but he said he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You need to let that verse of scripture sink in real good because it's a wonderful verse. Now I want to read another verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1, page 1279 in the original Schofield Reference Bible, and verse 12. Father, which cause I also suffer these things? Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I am persuaded he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Now Paul said he knew Jesus Christ. He didn't just say I know about him. I know him. I've committed my soul to him, and he's able to keep that I've committed unto him against that day. And so today I'm going to speak on the security of the believer. Now what I'm talking about today is not to be argued with sinners about. The real beautiful doctrine of the security of the believer is for God's people and God's people only. Now you need not argue with sinners about that. Many times sinners will try to argue with you about whether or not you're saved and eternally or can be lost again. Don't discuss that with a sinner. That's none of his business. His business is repent of his sins, get right with God. Then all of it will be his business. Now the matter of eternal security is the business of God's people. That, that's a family doctrine for the people of God that's to be loved and be appreciated in the word of God. Now it's true whether you believe it or not. A lot of people don't believe it, but that doesn't change the fact of it. It is true. There were two falling from grace preachers one time talking. One of them said, Jim... 
said, Jim said to Tom, said, uh, uh, Tom, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going, to, going to heaven and be dying pretty soon. I'm in ill health and I'll be going on to heaven. And, and uh, when I get up there, said, uh, uh, you want me to say a word for you? And, and uh, uh, Tom said, I'll tell you what, said, when you go to heaven, said, uh, you tell them that I'll be on some time later. Jim said, no, no, I'd never tell him that. He said, uh, a bicycle. He thinks now when he ceases his pedaling of the bicycle, he's going to fall over, he probably will. And uh, you have a lot of church members like that. If he stops his running and stops his doing things and stops going to church and things like that, then he'll just fall over like a man on a bicycle. That's it. Now he's lost again. Now salvation is not based on human efforts. It's not based on works. It's a gift of God as a very precious, precious doctrine for the people of God. Don't ever argue with a sinner about it. You're wasting your time. Tell him he needs to repent and get saved. Then after he gets saved, you can talk with him about spiritual things. This is something for you as a child of God to help you relax and rest in the Lord and serve God and not worry about going to hell. You need to worry about pleasing God and glorifying Him and doing things for Him and worry about that lost man going to hell. Now there's several scriptures that seem to imply that a man could be saved and then lost. I'll give you these hurriedly and then I'll move to a more positive side of it and show you some scripture that plainly tells you that when you're saved, you're saved eternally. Now in Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 through 45, when the unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walketh through dark places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house in which I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with himself seven other spirits more weakened than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be under this wicked generation. Now if you notice here, the unclean spirit went out and he decided to return. And when he came back to the man, he found the house empty, swept and garnished. The man had reformed. He quit cussing out loud. He quit drinking beer. He quit slamming the door off the hinges. He quit cussing his wife. And he had, he had reformed and started doing better. But nothing had come in. The Bible said it was empty. The house was empty. Now had the Spirit of God come in there, these evil spirits could not have gotten back in. But since it was empty, they came back in. Now this is reformation. A lot of people reform but never receive anything on the inside. You have a lot of people today that's reformed but they haven't received anything yet. You must receive Christ in the heart. When he comes in, the Bible said, Great is he that's in you than the he that's in the world. Now in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13, the Bible said, But he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now you've got to read your context. You've got to read that chapter and find out what he's talking about there. A lot of these fallen grace people will take that verse of scripture and jerk it up out of the context and try to found a doctrine of fallen grace on that. You can't do it. What he's talking about here is the tribulation period. And he's talking about the Jews during that particular time. If they will endure unto the end, they should be saved from the heel, the iron heel of the Antichrist. And will be delivered by Jesus Christ when he comes to set up his kingdom. It's not talking there about individual salvation at all. It's talking about them being saved from the Antichrist. Right. You need to read your Bible. See what God is saying there in the entire chapter. Then we find in John chapter 15 and verse 6. It said, if a man bide not in me, he's cast forth a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast him in the fire. And they are burned. Now this has to do with producing fruit. And it says men gather them. Didn't say God is going to take them and put them in fire. Some people say don't you see here God's going to take that backslider. And place him in hell fire. It doesn't say that. It's talking about men burning branches. God illustrating a truth. Then we go on to 1 John chapter 9 and verse 27. And there we find he said I keep under my body. And bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means will I preach to others. I myself should be a castaway. Some would say, now don't you see there, Paul is afraid he might get lost again. Doesn't say that at all. He's talking there about service. You need to read the context. See what the man is talking about. 
He's not talking about salvation at all. He's talking about service. And it's possible a man can be a castaway in his service for God. There's such thing as a man being put on the shelf and not used of God anymore. There's a certain fact of, of a, a Christian a person that once served God faithfully being a castaway as far as his service is concerned. Now he'll go to heaven when he dies, but he'll go there empty handed. That's what he's talking about. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20 and 22, the Bible said, For after they have escaped the pollution of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than the beginning. For it had been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness, that after they had known it, turned from the holy commandments delivered unto them. It didn't say here after they were saved. It said after they had the knowledge of the Lord. They had been informed. They had been instructed. After they had known the way of the Lord, the Bible said it happened on them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to a watering in the mire. Now this is a picture here, of course, of a positive, but it's a picture here of a, a, a dog that, uh, that continues to be a dog. He's not changed. He's not made a sheep. And it's a picture of a hog going back watering again in the mud hole. He's not been changed. He's still a hog. He still has that uh, instinct that he wants to go to the mud hole. Now he's talking here about a person hearing about these things, knowing about these things, been told about the way of salvation, been told about the way of God. He hears about it. He knows about it. He knows he should get right with God, but he stops short. He goes right back. He reforms. He might be dressed up for a while and live clean for a while, even go to church, maybe join the church, maybe sing out the same songbook as others and so forth. But after a while, he goes right back to the same old cesspools of iniquity because he stopped short. He didn't really get saved. Now, had this hog become a sheep, it had been a different story. Had this dog become a sheep, it would have been a different story. But they turned right back to the same old things the world. They only had a knowledge of these things. And of course they are far worse off now than ever before. If they hadn't known about it, they might have somewhat an excuse to a certain extent. But now they knew about it. And now there's no excuse for them. They go right back to the world again like you preaching to an individual. He knows what he needs to do to get saved. He knows he ought to repent, get right with God. He hears the preacher. He kind of reforms. And then he decides he just loves the world too well to give up the world for God. He goes back into the world. He's happy out there to juke joints, drinking, and cussing, and gambling, and living like the devil because he only reformed. He would have been better off if you never heard the gospel. I'd rather die and go to hell out of the jungles of Africa than to die and go to hell out of the heart of America. Man would be better off if he'd never heard the gospel than to hear it and then reject that gospel. That's what he's talking about here. Now if a man could be lost after he was saved, then of course we know that salvation would be of works and not of grace. I want that to sink in. If a man could be lost after he was saved, his salvation would be by his own human efforts, by works, and not by the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation does depend upon do's and don't do's. It depends solely upon what's already done for you on Calvary. You're not saved by works. You believe in, a, of course, a salvation that causes you to work for God, but you're not saved that way. Now we know that. We know the blood of Jesus Christ atones for the sins of mankind. I want you to watch this scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10 verses 12 through 14, the Bible said, But this man, after he had once a sacrifice, offered a sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from his foot inspect until his enemy made his footstool. Now notice this. For by one offering, get this now, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now who are those that are sanctified? They are the saved, born again believers. Amen. They have been set apart in Christ, baptized in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. 
They are the sanctified ones. And the Bible says here they are perfected forever. Didn't say they were perfected until they stopped going to church. Didn't say they were perfected until they took a drink of beer. Didn't say they were perfected until they uh, cursed out loud. It said they are perfected forever. Every true born again believer is a sanctified believer. And you are perfected forever. Forever the Bible tells us. So you don't get to heaven on what you do and don't do. Your rewards depend on that. You get to heaven by the grace of God plus nothing minus nothing. Now the Bible says in Acts chapter 13 verses 38 and 39. Be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So the word of God said through Jesus Christ we're justified uh, by all things and from all things according to the Bible. The Bible says then we have a great high priest at the right hand of God the Father ever ready to make intercession for us as his children. Hebrews 9 24 for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which the figure the truth but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us for God's people Jesus Christ is standing as your advocate your intercessor he's standing there as your great high priest your attorney if you please at the right hand of God the Father to plead your cause before God when the devil accuses you as a born again believer, if you do something that's not right, Jesus is there to plead your cause. He doesn't condone your sins, but he is your high priest to plead your cause. So whenever a, a Christian, a saved born again person makes a mistake or does something wrong, that doesn't mean now he's going to hell. It means that he's a Christian that sinned or made a mistake and he's confessed his sins. And get back into fellowship with God. And Jesus pleads his cause at the right hand of God the Father. Now somebody says, well, if I believe that kind of doctrine, I just go on down and get saved and go out and live like the devil. You wouldn't do any such thing. God won't save any man with that attitude. Right. There's no person with that attitude, with that purpose in mind, that could come to the altar any place he would like to go and ask God to save him with that in mind of going out in the world now since he got saved and live like the devil the rest of his days he might as well get up off his knees and go home and get drunk or whatever he's going to do God is not going to save a man that attitude People they get saved, when they get saved, they're tired of sin. They want to leave the sin world. They want to get right with God. They want to become a child of God. They won't do that, which is right. They don't come down in intention of getting saved and going out and live like the devil. Let nobody tell you that kind of stuff. God won't save any man with that in mind. If you come down here and say, preach ever now since man is once saved, always saved. I'll just come down and get, get once saved. They'll always be saved. I'll go out there and live like hell itself. Live like the devil. No, you won't. God won't save you, buddy. You better not come. you got to be willing to repent of your sins. Get right with God. Be willing to give up your sins and the sinful deeds of this world. And live for God if you expect God to save you. And people that really get saved are tired of the old sinful life. Know they're sinned against God. And they want to do that. They want to give it up and get right with God. Now, if a person could die and go to hell after he's saved, then you have one of God's own children in hell, a child of God in hell. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? There's not one true born-again believer that's ever been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ that'll ever spend one second in hell. Not one. If the devil could get one saved person into hell, he'd get us all. There's no way. Absolutely no way the devil could ever get one truly born again believer in hell. No way. No way. The blood of Jesus Christ takes care of that. And then the Bible promises tell us plainly that we're eternally saved. Let me give you a few. The Bible says in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, 
but it's passed from death unto life. Did God mean what he said there? Did God say what he meant? The Bible said there the saved person will never come into condemnation. That's final. That's the word of God. In John chapter 10 verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen. Did God say what he meant? Did he mean what he said there? He most certainly did. God said, I give unto them eternal life. How long a life is eternal life? It's forever. The word eternal means forever. When God saves you, he gives you a life that's going to exist forever. Eternal life. Eternal. God said it. I believe it. Oh, you may say, now preach Edward. It says there that no man can pluck them out of the Father's hand. I just, I can pluck myself out of you, man. God said no man could do that. No person, no woman could do that. There's no one, not even the devil, that's powerful enough to get you out of the hand of God. You're placed in the hand of Jesus Christ. He's placed in the hand of God. And there's not enough demons in hell. The devil himself can get you out of the hand of God. If the devil could do that, he'd be more powerful than God. He can't do it. He most certainly cannot do it. And then if a person could be lost after he's saved in Christianity, it would be no better than any other religion. See, we have Christianity, true Christianity. We have the word of God, the power of God, the authority of God in this book. Other religions don't have that. Now, if a person can be lost after he's saved, then his religion would be about like any other kind of religion. I'm glad it's true anyhow. I know a lot of people don't believe it. Uh, they said that John Wesley and George Whitfield got to arguing one time about whether or not you could be saved and lost again. And said that Wesley said you could be saved and lost again. And Whitfield said you save eternity, you cannot be lost again. And they got in such a hard argument about the thing until both of them almost lost it. But they went on to heaven. Is that something? Oh, beloved, listen to me. I'm glad that saved people are saved eternally. Amen. And whenever you're saved, you're just as sure to go to heaven as you're sitting in this building or as you know what your name is. More sure, even some. And so we realize that. Now, we'd all go to hell just alike if one Christian could go there because the Bible says all of us sin. James, brother James said in James chapter 4 and verse 17, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. If you could go to hell after you're saved, it'd be sin and send you there. And the Bible said if you don't do what you know you ought to do, then you'd go to hell according to that belief. You don't go to hell because of that. People go to hell because they refuse to repent of their sins and believe on Jesus Christ. You're not saved by do's and don't do's. It's none of us perfect. All of us come short of things we should do. Or many of us are guilty of sin of commission and the sin of omission. And if we could go to hell after we're saved, then these things would damn us in the pit of a burning hell. But we're kept by the power of God and the grace of God. And if you are saved, you are saved eternally. There's seven positive Bible teaching that a saved person can, can never be lost again. Let me give them to you hurriedly before I go off there. A Christian has been born from above. That's number one. 1 Peter 1, 23 says you're born again. Not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible. The word of God is living by the fear God's birth in your heart and soul is from above. The new birth, the spiritual birth. Of course, that's produced from above. God is the one that births you into his family. When you were born into your immediate family, you were the son or daughter of your parents forever. Forever. You were born into that family. So when you're born in the family of God, you're a child of God forever. You're born into that family. And then the Bible said they have everlasting life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. How long is everlasting? Well, you know how long it is. John chapter 3 and verse 36, he that believeth on the son hath, present tense, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son, you will not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So if you're saved, you already have everlasting life. 
The Bible said there's no condemnation to one who's believed in Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there's therefore no condemnation to the believer. No one can take us out of the hands of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. And sin is not charged to the Christian. Now let me explain that before I close my message. Let me give you a verse of scripture. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world. Now Jesus Christ paid the sin debt. Everything was charged to him. When you repent and become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, there is imputed unto you God's divine righteousness as he is so are you in the world. You are clothed in his divine righteousness. There's no sin can be imputed to that. The only way God can see you is in Christ in his pure holiness. The only way you can get to heaven is through the imputed righteousness of God is pure divine holiness. Every saved person is wrapped up in God's divine holiness and there's no sin can be charged to God's imputed righteousness that covers you and clothes you that will carry you to heaven. You absolutely, God sees you as though you had never sinned. God sees you as though you're not sinning now. And God sees you as though you will never sin. In his divine imputed righteousness, you are as perfect as perfect can be. And that's the only way you can get to heaven. Now, wait a minute. Let me handle the other side before I have a word of prayer. You may say, preacher, wait a minute. Can a saved person go out and, and commit sin? Yes, he can follow after the Adamic nature. And he can commit sin. But wait a minute. That sin is not imputed to his divine righteousness. imputed to God by God's power and authority and by the blood of Christ. God will deal with you as a child. If you go out and do things you should not do as a child of God and you don't confess it and ask God to forgive you, God may be long-suffering and patient and kind toward you and he loves you. God may have to take the razor strap to you. Now some of you old-timers know what that means. You young fellas back there don't know much about that razor strap. But in the olden days, that razor strap was real handy. Paul didn't only sharpen his razor on it, but he sharpened those young'uns with it. And he'd get that razor strap and, and wear them out if they didn't do right. Yeah. And if he went out and did things he told them not to do, he'd take the razor strap to them. Now that's the way we deal with our children. We chasten them. We whip them because they do wrong. Now God is not going to chastise or whip the devil's outfit. The way of the transgressor is already hard. And he'll hit it rugged and he'll die and go to hell if he don't get saved. But God's family is a different group of people. God chastens and corrects and guides and tests and tries his own children. So God will deal with you as children because no sin is going to be imputed unto that divine righteousness that God's imputed to you. No sin can be added to that. God's going to handle that part, the, the fleshly part, by giving you a good whipping and you getting down on your knees and asking God to forgive you. But in Jesus Christ, you are perfect, always will be. God sees you as you've never been committed sin in your life in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what's going to take you to heaven. And no man can go there in any other way. So you see then you have no part in keeping yourself saved or getting yourself to heaven. That's entirely of God. Your part is the Christian to please your father and obey your father and love your father and do that that pleases him. And when you do that, God's going to give you some gifts when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. And if you don't do that, God is liable to give you one of the greatest patterns you've ever had in your life as a saved person. God chastens, child trains, guides, tests, and tries his children. Because they're his and he loves them and that's for their own good. As far as the unsaved, the way of the transgressor's heart, God never chastens him. He makes his own road hard. He'll die and go to hell if he don't get saved. But his family is a different lot. Let me tell you this. You are saved and you're saved forever and you'll never be lost. And that ought to make you shout the victory. And that ought to make you more determined to love God 
and honor God than ever before because knowing you are eternally saved. You can swing over hell the sewing thread and shout at the devil and still be saved. If it comes to that, you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and you're complete and perfect in him and not in what you do and what you don't do. God bless you, you've listened well. You may say, preach, I still don't believe I, I'm eternally saved. Well, that's just bad. <laughs> you just have to lose a word about something. You keep pedaling your bicycle. The rest of us, we know where we're going and God's going to run our little motor for us and carry us on through. If you've got to pedal your way in, that's, that's rough. It gets kind of bad for you to have to do that. But I'm glad that you are eternally saved and you're going anyhow whether you believe it or not. Amen. amen. If you're glad you're eternally saved, say amen. amen. That's fine. God bless you. Stand to your feet. I preach just a few minutes longer than I usually do on Sunday morning, but got started then, couldn't get unstarted. And I'm glad anyway. Amen. God bless you. Bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father, I pray you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. Bless thy people. We're glad that salvation is of the Lord. We're glad it's eternal. We're glad your children will never go to hell. We're glad they can never be lost. But help us, Father, to please thee and glorify thee that we might receive reward on the other side that you might say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. David's going to play a stanza. So if you're in this building unsaved, backslidden, you want to join the church for any reason you want to come, walk down the aisle, let me help you while she plays softly for a moment. Would you do it? speaking to you we'll gladly help you do anything we can to help you if God is speaking to you anyone if you're not saved want to get saved want to come back to God want to join the church how about it just another moment or so and Service will be over. 